everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of joining you all as your host tonight as we explore the cities, mountains, and seaside towns of Slovenia, along with a very special guest. Now, speaking of our guest for the evening, it is my distinct privilege and pleasure to introduce um, a guide that has led our Best of the Adriatic tour, our Best of Eastern Europe tour, and our family tours. It is Slovenian guide extraordinaire, Sasho Golub. Sasho, welcome to Monday Night Travel. Dobro večer, everybody, and a warm hello from Slovenia. Sasho, it looks pretty dark outside there. Um, where are you and what time is it? Well, I am home and it is um, a little past, so it's 2.35 in the a.m. at the moment. Okay. Are you a night owl? Um, yes, yes. Okay. Well, yeah. that's good. I suppose today you get to be a night owl and an early bird because you'll be you going go. until five above. in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate you taking the time. Um, Sasho, I'm, I'm already guessing that one question that a lot of our viewers are going to have um, for you as somebody in Eastern Europe is about the current situation in Ukraine. Um, I mean, our heart really goes out to the people of Ukraine. Um, Rick has talked about that in past shows. But I'd like to know from you, what is the situation on the ground where you are in Eastern Europe beyond Ukraine? Well, at the moment, truth be said, truth be told, around here, we don't feel the effects of the unfortunate events in Ukraine. Um, as you said, our hearts go out to, to the people there, but um, as far as we are concerned, we don't have any immediate effects of what is going on. And um, I would imagine that even we are living in a slightly uncomfortable moment in, in history, it should not prevent us from living our travel dreams in this year. Yeah, and I mean, as Rick said, uh, conflicts like this are, are terrible, but they just illustrate the importance of travel and understanding other cultures and the ramifications of things like war. So- um, Probably more important than ever, yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that, you know, you, somebody who, who leads our Best of Eastern Europe tour is still um, feeling good and excited about a, a year of guiding. Um, oh, yeah. Speaking of which, Sasho, can you tell us how did you get involved um, in leading Rick Steves Europe tours? Well, the, the first one to be involved with Rick Steves in our family was my wife, um, Tina. Some of you may know her. So obviously she's the brain of the family on the muscle. Um, I had, it was a coincidence that led to a coincidence that finally led to that all important call from the Rick Steves headquarters. Uh, at that point, I had some different career ideas, but then I saw how much time, fun Tina had on tours and I decided to tag along. There was an opening and um, I never looked back since. So it's been a very fruitful decade and something with Rick Steves and no plans to do anything else in the near future. And I understand that Tina is currently leading a tour. She is currently leading a Venice, Florence, Rome tour and uh, she's going to head out to the Vatican in a couple of hours time. So she's <laughs> going to skip tonight. Well, we are glad that we have you here with us. And um, you and Tina yeah. also have your own kind of day tour company in Slovenia, correct? Yes, we do. We run a little uh, tour business around here where we take people on some pre-made tours that we put together, like the highlights of Slovenia. But we also put together um, a custom tour if need be. Uh, so it's if it's just a couple or just a somebody or a group of friends signing up for a tour, we're going to adjust the itinerary accordingly, I dare say. And we have quite a bit of experience living as a small country, so we can play around with, with your wishes and desires as much as you want. Excellent. Well, I um, we linked to in the in the resources for tonight's show, you can learn more about um, Sasho and Tina's company and I'm certainly excited to have a Slovenian expert to take us around Slovenia. I was telling you before in the show, Sasho, that working on this show, Slovenia has climbed to the ranks to be one of the countries I most want to visit um, in all of Europe. So I'm very excited to do a little virtual tour with you tonight. Shall we get started? Gremo. All right. Gremo. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, it's beaches, caves, and Alps. 
enjoying a cultural workout in Slovenia. Thanks for joining us. Tiny Slovenia, with just two million people, is one of Europe's most unexpectedly delightful destinations. Located where the Germanic, Mediterranean, and Slavic worlds come together, Slovenia has a unique appeal. We'll enjoy the playful architecture and lively cafe culture of its capital city. Row to a church-capped island, explore the Julian Alps, descend into a massive cavern, and sunbathe with Slavs on the tiny but inviting Slovenian coast. During most of the 20th century, Yugoslavia was on the other side of what was called the Iron Curtain. As Yugoslavia broke up into separate countries in the 1990s, Slovenia became independent after a 10-day war. We begin in the capital city, Ljubljana. After relaxing at Lake Bled, we loop through the Julian Alps and the historic Socha River Valley. We end at the Adriatic resort of Piran. So, Sasha, where in Slovenia do you live? Can you tell us roughly on this map? Uh, I can tell you very exactly, actually. I live just under the arrow that points at Lake Blit. So I live in the northwestern part of the country, a couple of minutes drive away from the lake itself. And so are, are you and the family able to go to Lake Bled just regularly? Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we can go to Lake Blit. Uh, Whenever we decide to, it's about a six, seven minute drive away from the house. Oh, is there, are people able to swim in Lake Bled in the summer? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are, I mean, there, there's people who are probably brave enough to do it on January 1st. We have this ice <laughs> swimming contest there. Uh, but the people who have more reasoning up here, uh, they will do it starting from about mid-May and then carrying on probably until the end of September, depending on the weather, obviously. And Sasha, on a May, on a January to May scale, how reasonable are you? What's the earliest you'll go in? Very reasonable. I'm I'm the June guy. I'm that reasonable. <laughs> Me too. I can't I can't do cold water. Excellent. Well, we look forward to seeing Lake Blood soon, but I think we're gonna get started in Ljubljana. Here we go. Ljubljana feels small. It is, with only about a quarter of a million people but it's by far the country's largest city, its cultural capital, and a charming place to kick off any Slovenian trip. A fortress has capped Ljubljana's hill since Roman times. As if turning its back on its hard-fought history, the city playfully straddles its sleepy river. Ljubljana is laid back, the kind of place where crumbling buildings seem elegantly atmospheric rather than shoddy. In its relaxed pedestrian center, it seems all roads lead to the main square. Fancy facades and whimsical bridges ornament daily life with a Slovenian twist. Centuries of rule from Vienna under the German-speaking Habsburgs seems to have both inspired an appreciation of the good life and strengthened the local spirit. The statue of Franza Prescherin, Slovenia's greatest poet, reminds locals that their language and culture are both distinct and worthy of pride. So, Sasha, does Slovenia have its own language? Yes, yeah, we do, our own, we do have our own language, yes. And what differentiates it kind of from other Eastern European languages? Well, we go to the, we are part of the Slavic uh, language group. Uh, what, what I think is very distinct for Slovenian and some other Slavic languages as well is uh, that we have a special grammatical form for too. So I like to say that Slovenian is a very romantic language. Hmm. When I invite my wife out, I'm only invited, inviting her, not somebody else, which would not always be the ideal situation. Uh, so we have a definite grammatical form that describes only the two of us. So it's singular, dual, let's call it, and plural. Interesting. Wow. I mean, for a, I used to be a high school Spanish teacher. For, so for a language nerd such as myself, that is probably the most fascinating fact I'll learn tonight. Um, <laughs> excellent. Um, well, let's continue through Ljubljana. 
The Triple Bridge, where the town square joins the river, is both a popular meeting place and a beloved symbol of the city. The bridge seems almost Venetian. That's because the architect recognized that Ljubljana is midway between Venice and Vienna. And the city itself was, and still is, a bridge between the Italian and the Germanic worlds. The riverfront market is a hive of activity, where big city Slovenes enjoy buying directly from the farmer. Over time, shoppers develop friendships with their favorite producers. In this tiny country, it seems like everybody knows each other. Some farmers still use wooden carts to bring veggies in from their garden patches. The market is a perfect opportunity to connect with the locals. So, Sasha, do you shop at Slovenian farmers markets frequently? Yes, I do, as much as I can, absolutely. And what's your favorite thing to buy from the farmer's market? Well, it's kind of a coincidence that Rick is standing next to cherries. I, I really love buying cherries from the vendors um, because, you know, you can always get, get a free bite here and there. And they are sort of the first fruit of the year. Uh, but if I'm completely and 100% honest with you, I love going to where they sell uh, meats and cheeses. So you can have a slice of that, taste it, and then carry on with your shopping. So, yeah, farmer's market are a big deal, and I love going to them. Well, Sasha, speaking of food, I understand that you've assembled a little feast. So can you give us a little Slovenian food tour of what's in front of you tonight? Oh, yeah, yes, with absolute pleasure. I was waiting too much on this, actually. Um, <laughs> so I have... Um, Two very typical things for the time of the year, obviously, it's uh, Easter week, so we're getting slowly ready for the big celebrations after we have been fasting for a while. Um, one very cool thing in Slovenia, or one very popular thing in Slovenia is sausage. This is the influence of the German culture, and I have what is called the Carniola sausage. Now, usually, you would have this boiled with a type of bagel served with some coarse radish and some mustard. Um, well, I like to play around in the kitchen a little bit, and I actually put it in, uh, the closest thing would be a pizza dough, and I roasted it, and so it looks kind of like this. When you go in Slovenia, you will most likely not find it, because this is sort of, quote-unquote, my invention, <laughs> uh, but it's just a sausage encased in dough, and I love enjoying that. But a bit of mustard on the side always works uh, very well. Now, for the season at the moment, obviously Easter, uh, we celebrate Easter with potica. Uh, we will talk about potica a little bit later on. I know, Gabe, you have some, and I also have some. So this is uh, what we have been waiting for practically since Christmas, uh, now until <laughs> Easter. And, you know, household to household, we bake this, and it's just sort of a, a celebration of, of uh, good food, good life, and happy times with the family. Um, we posted a, a blog on our page a while ago, and um, the first official recipe for potica is from the 1700s. And in the small caption of the blog, I, I posted like, you know, making kitchens, kitchens messy since 1775. It is sort of a mess <laughs> to do it, but it's absolutely worth the, the hardship. Well, Sasho, first, I, I feel privileged that I think what we should now call the, the Sasho sausage, um, since <laughs> it's your own creation, made its debut on Monday Night Travel. You know, I think 200 years from now, people are going to be talking about when the Sasho sausage started. Um, but <laughs> unfortunately, I'm a vegetarian, so I can't enjoy it. But I do have enough potitsa from the Copper Pot Bakery in Seattle um, to definitely get in all the calories that I need. So I will not go. <laughs> no shortage there, no. But. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm glad that both of us have um, some sustenance to get us through the rest of this Slovenian journey. And let's continue on that journey now. Dobre dan. Dobre dan. Um, cherries? Yes. Uh, half kilo. How do you say half kilo? Whole kilo. Whole kilo. Whole kilo. Whole kilo. This is your farm? Our farm, yes. They are fresh. Yes, they're very good. These scales allow buyers to immediately double check the arithmetic, just in case. Habsburg days left locals with the old saying trust is good, control is better. Half a kilo, is just right. Sasha, can you explain that? What does that mean, trust is good, but control is better? 
this is another thing that shows you how culturally influenced we've been by the nations that surround us. This is a very German saying, but we sort of adopted it and made it into our own. Um, so we like to double check on people here and there. Excellent. All right, here we go. The market's picturesque colonnade is designed to link the town and the river. It feels made to order for conviviality, enjoying a drink or observing the market action. Nearby, vintners proudly share their wines. These wines from the northeast of Slovenia are considered some of the country's best. Perhaps Ljubljana's single best activity is simply strolling the riverfront promenade and sitting in an outdoor cafe to watch the stylish Slovenes strut their stuff. As home to the country's main university, youthful Ljubljana is busy with students. An earthquake leveled the city in 1895. It was rebuilt in the Art Nouveau and Art Deco styles so popular in Vienna, the empire's capital at the time. Ljubljana remains a treasure trove of engaging architecture. This striking building was designed by an ambitious local architect, hoping to forge a uniquely Slovenian style. But the big name in local architecture and urban design is Joža Plečnik. Like Gaudi-shaped Barcelona and Bernini-shaped Rome, Plechnik shaped Ljubljana. He lived in the early 20th century, studied in Vienna, made his name in Prague, and had his greatest impact right here in his hometown. Prolific Plechnik essentially remodeled his hometown with his distinctive classical meets modern style. Along with the triple bridge and the market colonnade, Plechnik's brilliance for urban design, the ability to connect Ljubljanans to their city and river, is evident in his Cobbler's Bridge. Because he loved his town, walked to work each day, and had to live with what he designed, Plechnik was particularly thoughtful about incorporating aesthetics, nature, and people's needs into his work. The house of Ljubljana's favorite son is on an unassuming street. But behind the gate, in his garden, the creative world of Plechnik opens up. Guides passionate about his work give meaning to his home. So this is Plechnik's room, where he worked and he slept here. So his bed right next to his work table? Yes, absolutely. And a single bed, was he never married? No, he was married to the architecture. But on the other hand, you have here a gilded sculpture on the top of the ceiling. Ooh. Some kind of a muse, you know. But if you look all around, you will see there are many, many personal objects. His glasses, or for example, his hat. He was famous by that hat. He was always wearing it and always dressed in black. So Plechnik is very important to the Slovenian people. Absolutely. He left such a strong mark. Uh, not only in Vienna and Prague, but definitely in Ljubljana. Because all the land axes and river axes are designed by Plechnik. And his heritage lives on today as the people enjoy his city. That's the most important. All the bridges are crowded, you know, and the architecture really lives, uh, even nowadays. If this city works for its people and fits their character, it's at least in part thanks to Josha Plechnik. In Slovenia, so small and so laced with modern freeways, virtually every site is within an hour or two of the capital city. Uh, Sasha, I have a quick kind of logistical travel tip question for you. If, if Slovenia is so small and pretty much everywhere is within two hours of Ljubljana, do you recommend that people maybe make Ljubljana a home base and do more day trips throughout that? Or do you think that there is value to staying overnight in other places in Slovenia? First and foremost, I think for travelers, the value is in their comfort. Uh, for me, if you don't mind moving from, point, from one location to the other, I would always recommend you to move because the distances in Slovenia are so short, yet culturally and our mindset is so different from Sometimes we can say literally from village to village, it's absolutely worth to, to move about a little bit and get in touch with the local uh, people a bit more. In Ljubljana, Ljubljana is very metropolitan and it's, you know, it's, it's lively and everything, but you still don't get that proper, I mean, Slovenia feeling uh, if you just stay put, uh, say, in, in one location. I would always recommend people move around just to get sort of the, the sense and the smell of the local culture, wherever they are intending to go. Excellent. I mean, 
I completely agree as well. I always love trying to get a blend of bigger cities and also maybe smaller towns or rural areas in my travel. It definitely gives it a different flavor. And we have a few locations coming up in the show that people can consider spending other nights when they're in Slovenia. So let's see some of those now. We're headed north into Slovenia's Julian Alps. Our first stop is the country's top alpine resort, Lake Bled. Since the Habsburg days, this is where Slovenes take their guests, whether kings or cousins, to show off their natural wonders. The castle is striking, as are the views from the castle. Lake Bled retains an aura of the Romantic Age. Slovenes are particularly fond of their famous local pastries. The decadent Kremschnita artfully sandwiches layers of cream and vanilla custard between sheets of delicate crust. Lake Bled's iconic island is the focal point of any visit. Romantic platina boats, unique to this lake, ferry visitors back and forth. Locals still build their platinas by hand with larch wood from a design passed down from father to son for centuries. There's no keel, so the skilled oarsmen work hard to steer the flat-bottomed boat with each stroke. The island has been a special gathering point through the ages. 99 steps lead from the dock up to the summit and the Church of the Assumption. A local superstition claims that if you ring this bell three times, your wish will come true. While no motorized boats disturb the tranquility of Lake Bled, it does have its human-powered speedboats. Bled is the rowing capital of Slovenia. Crews stroke rhythmically through glassy waters, merging natural and human grace. So, Sasho, if you live so close to Lake Bled, do you ever go, go for a row? Oh, no, not in, not in this type of boats. I would have the... Um, Rowing property of a stone? No, by no means. This is reserved <laughs> for professionals. No. Um, what are some of the most popular sports in Slovenia? Well, if we're talking about the island, uh, about the lake, um, obviously it would be swimming. Um, when you look at the modern, now we have the stand-up pedal boards on the lake as well. So that's sort of a, a new addition to what is going on in Slovenia. I would dare say that in general, the most popular sport for the locals here is hiking. Uh, we do well in soccer, we play basketball, volleyball, and you know, all, all sorts of sports. But uh, I would say, in general, when you meet a Slovenian, you can almost judge with certainty that he or she is a hiker. We like to go to the mountains. Very nice. Same, same thing out here in Seattle. Have you ever done any good hikes when you're here for the guide reunions? The guide reunions, they happen in January, so oh. we sort of stayed away from hiking thus far things may change you never know that's true well come sometime in the summer and i'll take you on a good hike sasha <laughs> there we go all right well let's continue our exploration of the julian alps strolling the three miles around the lake visitors enjoy ever-changing views also enjoying dramatic lake views are handsome villas mostly from the 19th century my favorite was once the vacation villa of Yugoslav President for Life, Marshal Tito. Slovenia was one of six republics that united to make Yugoslavia, a country that existed basically from just after World War I until the 1990s. Tito, a larger-than-life, strong-armed dictator, was the one leader able to hold that troubled union together. When Tito ran Yugoslavia, he huddled with foreign dignitaries from Indira Gandhi and Nikita Khrushchev to Kim Il-sung right here. After Tito died in 1980, his villa was converted into a classy hotel, offering guests a James Bond ambience. In this high-end suite, you can actually sleep in the dictator's bed and visitors can use Tito's personal desk for something I bet he never imagined, sending an email. Monday Night Travelers, do you recognize who that is? Um, if you've been watching the show for a while, 
uh, you might notice that that is a younger Cameron Hewitt. Um, I'm having deja vu. I just saw him sitting at his computer a few minutes ago. Here in what was Tito's ballroom, a mural survives, telling of World War II heroics. After the Nazis bombed Belgrade and took over their country, the ragtag gang of Yugoslav patriots, inspired by charismatic commanders, formed a resistance army. Vastly outgunned, they fought back valiantly, eventually defeating the German invaders. Tito and his partisan army booted the Nazis without Soviet support. That's why, unlike his Eastern European neighbors, Tito could and did chart his own course, independent from the USSR. My friend and Slovenian tour guide, Tina Hiti, is joining us to help sort out the Yugoslav puzzle. I find this propaganda so stirring. I can see how it would make people just want to wave a flag. Yeah, this is a very typical socialist realism propaganda. It was all over Eastern Europe. And if you look at the picture, you can see the proud workers you know, carrying their tools, you can see them with shovels. Yeah, and then you can see here the true representative of a strong woman uh, carrying a child and proudly waving the flag. But still, you know, it's a propaganda of Eastern Europe, but it was so different over here. We were never inside the Warsaw Pact. That's why maybe the faces are a little happier. So how was communism in Yugoslavia different from all the communism we think about with the yeah. USSR? Well, we chose our way, the third way we called it. And it was a lot different, like we could travel, we had free market economy, and there were jobs for everybody, social system was good. Tito had some magic ability to bring it together. Well, probably his magic ability was that he was a mix of all the nationalities that included Yugoslavia. His mom was a Slovene, his dad was a Croat, and his wife was a Serb. So he was the only true Yugoslav there was. Today, are you happier with or without Tito in Yugoslavia? I will say I was happy that I could live a part of Yugoslavia, but I'm happy to be living in European Union as well now. So, um, Sasha, uh, that, that was your wife, Tina, who's also a guide. I can see why you say um, she's the brains, not that not as a reflection of you, but she, she seems very intelligent. Um, and I don't want you to put you in a position to disagree with her, but do you agree with her? Or did you feel happy to have lived in Yugoslavia um, under Tito? And are you now happy though to live in the EU? Yes, absolutely. I mean, yes, you did kind of put me to the spot, but never mind that. Uh, it, it is... Um, it's sort of a historical privilege for us to have the, the opportunity to say that we have lived under a, a regime that was very different and very unique uh, in a global scale of things. Uh, but yes, yeah, at the, at, at the end of the day, um, where we are at the moment, I think it's a much more preferable situation than what we have had uh, now almost 30 years ago. Um, Things have changed dramatically. They were not bad to begin with, but they have changed dramatically for the better. And um, I think we are better off in the low, in the situation that we are in at the moment. Great. Well, I'm glad that you and Tina agree. But if you disagree with her on anything else in the episode, she doesn't have to know that there's a recording of this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. This land has seen lots of change, but one thing that's constant is the warmth and hospitality of its people. This is my mom and dad. Dobar dan. Dobar dan. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Tina's having us over for dinner to meet her family. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Sasha. Sasha, there you are. There you are with your your son, and I'm going to to quickly stop the video because um. I hear that you have an update on where your family is now. Um, so here's a photo. Can you tell us who this is in the photo? So, uh, well, that's uh, us. You saw the little one, which is now standing next to me uh, when Rick was here in 2009. So things have changed ever so slightly since. That's uh, Anje, my oldest, so he's 14. Uh, the younger one you could not see because he was still in Tina's belly. So he, this is Tomasz, he's 12 now. And uh, my father-in-law, Tina's dad, uh, who you saw in the black t-shirt over there. So they're all happy campers on the hockey, uh, on, on the ice at the moment, including me lately. So it's kind of fun to yeah. see them in a slightly different form. 
And I hear that the family has quite the hockey history. Uh, well, excluding me, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my father-in-law is a former pro. Uh, he was part of the Yugoslav national national Olympic team. Um, if things went according to his plan, he would be one of the first players from this region to play in, in the NHL. So yes, there is a bit of a history here. Excellent. Well, it's I cannot believe that your son has grown up that much um, since the episode was filmed. I feel it's like you, while, yeah. you have not aged a day, Sasho. Um, Thank you, babe. But a very handsome family. Thank you. All right. Well, let's continue and let's spend some time with um, your and Tina's family. Sasha. Sasha, yeah. And, and uh, Anja. 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 Uh-oh. Little Anja's more interested in bedtime than us. While Grandma and Grandpa take care of him, Tina and Sasha are giving us a peek at their apartment. They converted the attic of Tina's childhood home, creating plenty of space for their growing family. So here we are. Whoa, this is quite a surprise. When you come in, you don't realize how much is here. It doesn't show from the outside, does it? You wouldn't know, looking up here. It looks yeah. just like a, a, a loft. It's a secret compartment of our house. With grandma and grandpa downstairs. <laughs> Built-in babysitter. This is our living room. This is where we spend the rainy afternoons. This is very comfortable and very spacious, really. Above grandma and grandpa's. Above. Now, yeah. I still can't get over that, because i got to say, in America, there's a stigma about people in their 30s still mm -hmm. with their mom and dad raising their kids upstairs. It's a usual thing around here. Very typical. All right. And so, Sasha, that is right where you are now, correct? Yes, yes. We, this, this, right here, this that window. That's the window right behind me, yeah, yeah. Oh, wonderful. It's nice to get a sense of where you are in the daylight. <laughs> Still, with their mom and dad, raising their kids upstairs. It's a usual thing around here. Very typical. All right, and this is the little kid's room. Anja is, Anja it, yeah. is his name. The room is soon going to be shared by another baby, which is due in four and a half months. So in four months? Yep. Anja will have a roommate. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> this is to... great. While the two families live separately, they share lots of dinners. And the hearty local food provides a good foundation for a lively conversation. This is very interesting to me because this is food I would think about in Germany or Austria or in the north. But, but we're right in the middle. Italy, well, Germany. Yeah. And how does that affect your culture? Um, we are punctual when, it, when we need to be punctual, we will be on schedule when we need to be on schedule, but we can also be really laid back, relaxed, mellow about certain things. If you're angry, what? We what? will curse, seriously. In Slovene? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. What would you tell me? I will say, may you be killed by a horse, or... That's your worst? 300 <laughs> hairy bears, this <laughs> would be just about our worst. 300 spell. hairy bears? Yes. That's worse than your mother wears army boots. Sasha, what? What does 300 hairy bears mean? I assume that something's lost in translation, but... Uh, it, it gets lost in translation, but it's, it's an old, old curse word, let's call it. Mm. Um, the devil was always considered as hairy, right? So um, it starts with 300 as being a big number, and like a, it's not really considered as a negative number, but just a big sum. And uh, it was 300 hairy devils to begin with. And then it later on became even worse with 300 hairy bears. But um, it just has a sort of a very historic flow to it. And we really, this is sort of the worst we can say when it comes to bad language. That's just <laughs> the way we are. All right. Well, I think I'm just going to start using 300 hairy bears in my daily life as well. You, so. you can go worse, yeah. You can maybe say go, <laughs> you know, baptize Matthew, or you can even use uh, may you be kicked by a horse or a chicken, depending <laughs> on how negative your emotions towards the other person are. Wow, kicked by a chicken. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. You grew up with Tito. Are you nostalgic about Yugoslavia? No, 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 nostalgic because now we use better than in former Yugoslavia. But then in former Yugoslavia there are good things and also bad things. Maybe one of the better things was for young families because they can get apartment, they can get a job. Bad things about Yugoslavia was maybe because there was not good stimulation for good workers. For good or bad workers the wage was all was the same. So Yugoslavia was good for bad workers? It was good for bad workers, yeah. 
And today, capitalism is uh, good for good workers. It's good, yeah. There's really no better way to get to know a place than enjoying a meal with a local family. <laughs> this northwestern corner of Slovenia, within yodeling distance of both Austria and Italy, is crowned by the Julian Alps. Exploring the Slovenian countryside, you get the feeling that things work. Valleys that just a generation ago were industrial wastelands are green and getting greener. Villages gather around Baroque bell towers amid rich farmland. The unique roofed hay rack is recognized as part of the national heritage. In this unpredictable climate, hay is hung on the rack to dry. These Alps, with their craggy limestone ridges, bring to mind Italy's Dolomites just over the border. Like the more famous Alps of Austria and Switzerland, the Julian Alps are busy with nature lovers, both winter and summer. In the center of this region stands Mount Triglav, Slovenia's symbol and tallest mountain. Locals claim that you're not a true Slovene until you've climbed Triglav. Versic Pass, which comes with 50 hairpin turns, was originally a military road. It was built during World War I by 10,000 Russian prisoners of war. In 1916, an avalanche thundered down the mountainside, killing hundreds of these workers. This little Russian chapel, built where the final victim was found, offers today's visitors a chance to pay their respects to those who made this scenic drive possible. At the crest of the 5,000-foot-high pass, there's snow even in late May. Um, Sasha, is there still snow in late May? Um, as we look yeah. at kind of some of Slovenia's natural wonders and farming, um, are you seeing any effects of climate change um, begin to um, affect the area? Yes, yeah. Uh, well, we just got fresh snow two days ago. So the, the peaks where uh, Tina and Rick were, uh, the Vršić Pass is currently unpassable by car because there's too much snow. Um, we are seeing effects, yes. Um, mostly where I live, it's not felt that much because we're still sort of sheltered by the Alps. So we don't get that effect that much. There's a little slight change in seasons, but um, not that terrible. Um, what is more prominent in, in the way things are showing is with the wine culture, with the production of wine, things are showing more than they did, say, a generation ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, wine production will probably just keep going further and further north. Um, yeah. But are there, is Slovenia a large wine producer? Is that, um, what's what's the good wine country in Slovenia? Um, well, you have, we're not really a large wine production because we are a small country to begin with, but uh, we do ex make some really good quality wines here. So um, you have the, the western part of the country is the south, southwestern part of the country is practically all wine country and then you have the northeast and you have the southeast where wine is produced here in the alps we tried oh god we tried but it just doesn't work so uh hmm. there's other parts of slovenia where we get the wine from and yes you are able if you're into that um, there's a ton of fantastic slovenian wine available great thank you let's continue onwards the road switchbacks down into the valley of the socha river Springy suspension bridges offer a memorable roadside stop. The Socha continues to cut its way deeper and deeper into this gorge. Tiny bits of limestone, the geological equivalent of sawdust around here, reflecting under the brilliant blue skies, give the river its rich turquoise color. While the valley's a favorite for nature lovers today, it has its dark side. This was the scene of some of the fiercest fighting of World War I. With over a million casualties, it was nicknamed the Valley of the Cemeteries. This peaceful river valley was known as the Socha Front, or the Isonzo Front in Italian. Before independence, before Yugoslavia, Slovenia was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In 1915, neighboring Italy declared war on the empire. They quickly took this valley, driving the Austro-Hungarians high into these mountains, from where the Austro-Hungarians fended off 10 bloody uphill Italian offensives. The Cluja Fort keeps vigil over the narrowest part of the valley, which leads from Italy through Slovenia toward Austria. 
The Austro-Hungarians knew if their enemies could break through this front, it was a straight shot to their capital, Vienna. But the Socha front was 60 miles wide, and many of the defenses were more crude and remote. Every ridge was strategic, and much of the fighting was actually done high, way up on the frigid mountain cliffs. The defenses included a web of tunnels that went all the way to the tops of the mountains. A museum in the town of Kolberid tells the story of the Socha Front and humanizes the suffering of this horrific but almost forgotten corner of World War I. This was unimaginably difficult warfare, waged in the harshest of conditions. Trenches were carved into ice and rock instead of mud, and many ill-equipped conscripts froze to death. During one winter alone, some 60,000 soldiers were killed by avalanches. Just above town, a somber memorial to the Italian attackers was built in the stern fascist style under Mussolini. It memorializes 7,000 Italian soldiers, victims of just one battle. The poignant reality? Costly battles eventually fade into the history books, like the Socha Front. So, Sasha, I'm, I'm interested. Um, both in terms of you know some of the World War I monuments like this, but um, also with some of the you know with the battles and, and fighting that went on um, in Yugoslavia during your lifetime, um, what do you think? Do you feel like Slovenians or people from your part of the world have kind of a different perspective on the costs of war or um, you know modern conflict like what we're seeing in Ukraine? Well, looking at what is going on at the moment, it seems like we have not learned much now, did we? You know, it's a hundred, a little over a hundred years since we had to build memorials like this to the people that lost their lives. Uh, we are, um, as a nation, we are very mellow. So you don't, you cannot really expect the Slovenians starting a war anytime soon. I wouldn't imagine something like this happening. Um, but I think it's um, Locations like the one on the picture, and there's several along the valley, as Rick mentioned, this nickname, the Valley of the Cemeteries, um, have given us a slightly deeper appreciation of freedom, I would think, you know, as, as a nation in general, we don't really enjoy any war connected things, you know, we are more mellow, we're sort of peaceful, and I think we, we've learned to appreciate our freedom a bit more through situations like that one. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to imagine, um, yeah, something so terrible happening in a place that today is so beautiful. Um, so it's it's lovely to see um, the the valley restored to to a place of peace. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A short drive takes us into a totally different landscape. Slovenia's Karst region, a high, fertile, and windblown plateau. In this land of stout hill towns and rugged farmers, grapes for the full-bodied local red wine thrive in the iron-rich soil. Since the limestone upon which everything around here sits is easily dissolved by water, the karst is honeycombed with a vast network of caves and underground rivers. The most dramatic cave to tour is Škocjan. Visitors begin by seeing a multitude of formations in a series of large caverns. Guides tell the story as drip by drip, stalactites grow from spaghetti-thin strands to mighty sequoia-like stone pillars. In the Grand Cavern, the sound of a mighty river crashes through the mist. Chiseled into the wall, the scant remains of century-old trails evoke the early days of tourism here. It's a world where a thousand evil Wizard of Oz monkeys could comfortably fly in formation. Crossing a breathtaking footbridge 150 feet above the torrent gives you faith in Slovenian engineering. The cave finally widens. Sunlight pours in and visitors emerge like lost creatures seeking daylight into a lush canyon. Sasho, um, for people interested in visiting some more rural sites like this, do you recommend renting a car or are there buses that will take you out to rural sites? Uh, what do you think is best? Either or. Um, there are buses that will collect you, connect you to sites like this. I mean, Skotsen is very much on the map uh, in regards of, of 
tourism in Slovenia. I, <clears throat> if you don't mind, excuse me, I, if you don't mind driving, I would always, always, always recommend you to take a car. Because it just gives you so many more options and it allows you for so much more, let's call it freedom, uh, to explore and uh, preferably get lost and, you know, <laughs> expect one of those fun experiences when you, uh, which you get when you get lost. So I would always be in favor of um, driving on your own. Uh, if that's not your spiel, uh, then yeah, you can absolutely rely on public transportation. With that in mind, there will be a couple of sites that you simply will not be able to get to because they're not covered by public transportation. And is Slovenia a pretty nice place to drive? We don't yeah. have, it's not like the UK where you're on the other side of the road on these oh. super narrow highways. No, 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 not at all. No, um, you will be, you'll be comfortable driving where the signage, are, signs are okay. The highways, the, the, the highways are quite slick. So you can get, you know, if you're in a hurry getting from one location to the other, it will not take you too much time. Um, in regards of, yeah, orientation it's not really a big deal and you know when you get lost in slovenia you will go off your track by about four miles so there's nothing really to worry about <laughs> you know, if you get lost you're in for a fun experience so um no i wouldn't worry if you if you don't mind driving uh i would definitely recommend you to drive the one thing that i say don't drive and that's simply because it's going to take so much away from the driver if you remember a couple of minutes ago uh, Rick was talking about Vršić Pass and the road that was built in the time of World War One, mm -hmm. with the 51 hairpin, hairpin turns there. Uh, this would be a location, unless you're super crazy about driving, uh, I would say rather not, um, simply because there's a lot that's going to be taken away from the person who's driving in regards of views and just the sheer beauty of the area that you visit. Other than that, uh, if you don't mind it, get a car and just enjoy Slovenia. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Nearby, wedged into another karst region cave, is Predjama, one of Europe's most photogenic castles. There's been a castle here for nearly a thousand years. The mouth of the cave provided a strategic place for some feudal lord to stick his fortified manor house. This version dates from the 16th century. While there's little reason to go inside, the castle makes an ideal spot for a scenic drink and a great capper for our visit to the Karst region. While neighboring Croatia is famous for its coastline, Slovenia enjoys its own 29-mile stretch of Adriatic seafront. That's about one inch per resident. Its best stop, the town of Piran. Many Adriatic towns are overwhelmed by tourists and concrete. But Piran has kept itself charming and in remarkably good repair while holding the tourist sprawl at bay. Crowded onto the tip of its peninsula, Piran can't grow. The main square was once a protected harbor until it began to stink so badly they had to fill it in. Sasha, why did it, do you know why it stank so badly? It's very simple. Um, well, back in medieval days, there was no internal plumbing. Europe forgot about internal, internal plumbing with Romans disappearing. And it's also, a, 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 it was a small bay, let's call it, which got no water changing. And, you know, with the tidal movement, there was no, there is no proper tidal movement in the Adriatic to begin with. And so, you know, there were streams of certain content flowing into that little harbor, which didn't really wash out on a regular basis. And this is what led it to have a particularly unpleasant smell, <laughs> yes. Does it smell a little bit better today? Uh, yeah, yeah, you wouldn't, okay, you wouldn't okay. even know. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't even know something like this. <laughs> Not at all. Good, I'm glad. A colorful mix of work and pleasure boats filled today's harbor. These days, Peron's walls are inviting rather than defensive, and the town is simply an enjoyable place in which to relax. Explore the evocative back lanes. Hike up to the cathedral, scale the Venetian-style bell tower. On top, catch your breath by enjoying views of Piran and nearly the entire Slovenian coastline. The traffic-free harbor front, lined with Slovenes enjoying fresh seafood, is made to order for a stroll. Swimmers frolic, 
while sunbathers claim more than their share of the national coastline. Piran clusters around its showpiece square, Piazza Tartini. As with most towns on the Adriatic, it was long ruled by nearby Venice and retains its Venetian flavor. In fact, the town's officially bilingual, Slovene and Italian. Today, the square is enjoyed by visitors and locals of all generations, savoring the good life where the Slavic world, the Alps, and the Mediterranean all come together. This fascinating and offbeat corner of Europe is one more example of the continent's many hidden charms. I hope you've enjoyed Slovenia. I'm Rick Steves. Until next time, keep on traveling. Sasho, uh, what, a, what a beautiful country. Um, I, I really enjoyed that look at Slovenia. And I'm just wondering, have you, have you always known that you wanted to stay in Slovenia? Was there ever a time that you thought you might move elsewhere, um, or is Slovenia just just home for you? I never thought about moving elsewhere for a moment. For as much as I like traveling and I will travel for as long as I can, uh, I never thought of living anywhere else. And what do you love so much about Slovenia? Why is it such a good place to live? Well, I, you know, it's home. It's just, you know, I, I sort of feel connected to the area where where I live in and I have all my family, all my friends are here. And um, it, it, to begin with, I couldn't, I couldn't go without them. Uh, but, you know, it's just that comfort of knowing exactly what to expect, when to expect it and how to expect it. And it's just, I don't know why, Slovenians in general, we have very deep roots and I'm just another Slovenian with very deep roots with no intention of, of moving anywhere, um, you know, even the situation that we have here, my in-laws being just a floor below me, it's not all that common back in, in the States. And um, just this, I don't know, sort of a connection of, of who we are and what we do is just, no, I'm, I've never considered moving anywhere, so. Well, thank you for sharing your um, home country with us. And speaking of deep roots and deep traditions, um, it is Holy Week in Slovenia. Um, Easter is this upcoming Sunday. Um, and I know that there are a lot of great um, Easter traditions in Slovenia. And there's a lot of things that families and people are doing around the country right now to prepare. And I was hoping that you could, um, we could watch some of those and you could give us some additional information. So shall we um, finish the show with just a few Easter preparations? Let's do, yes. All right. Let's go. In beautiful Slovenia, in the remote region of Bela Kraina, where many of Slovenia's folk tales were born, old customs have been kept alive in villages tucked among the hills and forests. The region's isolation has preserved these traditions, which over the centuries have morphed from those prescribed by the seasons to those prescribed by the church. In medieval times, to celebrate the arrival of spring after months of scarcity, decorated eggs were offered as gifts. Many families still dye their Easter eggs according to tradition. Spring leaves and flowers from the garden are pressed onto an egg, wrapped in gauze, and then boiled in onion skins. After the gauze is removed, the eggs are left to cool, now beautifully decorated with stamps of springtime. Today, Slovenian decorated eggs are a revered folk art and prized gifts at Easter. This woman is using a delicate technique of drawing on the shell with a tool loaded with hot beeswax. She then dyes the egg with natural colors. Finally, eggs are rubbed in pig's fat to lend a nice sheen. While techniques vary, decorated eggs with designs inspired by nature add heritage and local pride to Easter celebrations. Slovenes today value this humble gift just as they did in medieval times. Sasho, is the decorating of Slovenian eggs, is that something that either you did as a child or you do with your kids today? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a very, very present um, tradition. Uh, we do it the traditional way, the way it was shown in the beginning with the onion peels. Yes, yeah. Still very much part of what we do for Easter. And I mean, having done this, I assume with young children, are there a lot of broken eggs in those early years? 
Yes, yeah, yeah. Here and there, here and there, you have to do more cleaning than decorating, but yeah, it, it just comes as part of the, the story, I guess. Yeah, the best crafts are always the messiest ones. There you go. As their grandmothers did, these village women enjoy working together as they embroider cloths to cover the Easter baskets that'll hold their eggs and special foods for a blessing. In Slovenia, Lake Bled is nestled at the foot of the Julian Alps. This spectacular and romantic location is famous as a summer resort, although in the springtime, it can be chilly. But the weather doesn't stop townsfolk from making the short trip on a Pletna boat to the lake's island. Next to the island's church is a bakery, famous for Slovenia's Easter bread, called potica. This holiday treat, much loved by Slovenes, represents Jesus' crown of thorns and is eaten for Easter brunch. Potica is a log of sweet bread filled with a paste of walnuts and honey, chopped almonds, and fruit. It's placed in a ceramic bunt pan. And after baking, it's flipped to reveal the finished potica. Sacho, how's your potica tasting? It's tasting good. It's not my mother-in-law's, but it's good enough. Is your mother-in-law's the best? Always, yeah. I mean, at the moment, because Tina's away on tour. Tina now took the tour <laughs> of baking the potica at home, but uh, she's away on tour at the moment. So the last time she did it was Christmas, but yes, yeah. Well, I'm very much enjoying mine a lot. I love the, the honey nut paste in it. It's delicious. That's good All right. stuff, yeah. Well, we're gonna finish up uh, with one more clip of some Slovenian Easter baskets, and then we will get to questions. So if you have any last questions, everybody, uh, submit them now for Julianne to sort through. This busy baker will make a couple dozen of these today in anticipation of the coming feast. Back in Slovenia's Bela Krajina, a self-sufficient old farmer wears the region's traditional white linen, which he wove himself. He packs up his Easter feast for a blessing. Smoked pork representing Christ's body, horseradish root for the nails on the cross, potica for the crown of thorns, and hard-boiled eggs dyed red for the blood Christ shed. It's all packed into a basket and covered with the embroidered cloth. For centuries, it's been a tradition for Slovenes to gather during Holy Week to have these baskets of symbolic Easter foods blessed by their priest. Some go by boat to the island church. Some gather at humble roadside chapels. And others bring their baskets to timeless village churches. All right, excellent. Well, I mean, th that show made me excited to travel to Slovenia and it made me excited for the upcoming Easter festivities this week. Um, thank you so much, Sasha, for taking time out of your night to chat with us. Um, I know that we have some great questions from the audience. Uh, before we get to those though, we always have a quick word from our sponsor. Our span sponsor tonight, as always, is Rick Steves Europe. Um, and I want to encourage everybody, if you are tour people, um, consider our Best of Eastern Europe or Best of the Adriatic Tour. You may have Sasha as your guide, you may have Tina or one of our many other capable guides, but they are all um, just as personable and knowledgeable as Sasha. Um, and additionally, if you're more of an independent traveler, uh, you can always consider the Rick Steves, we have a Croatia and Slovenia guidebook, or as we mentioned, um, Tina and Sasha also have um, some shorter trips that you can look into, and all of those resources are in the chat widget. All right, so Sasha, we have some questions from the audience for you. Um, I'm glad to see that we have some language nerds in the audience, like myself. Um, and one viewer is wondering, um, which language do students learn in school in Slovenia? 
So with um, education around here, you get English as the first foreign language in um, the first grade, and this is with the age of six, you enter elementary, and this is where you immediately get English. And you will have English as part of the curriculum until the ninth grade, so finishing at the age of 14. There's a couple of schools who offer an extracurriculum activity um, as a, another foreign language, it depends. You can choose between German, French, Italian, partly depending on the region, partly depending on the school. And then uh, with the high school, which you enter at the age of 15, 14, depending, uh, you will add one more foreign language. Uh, with those, again, there's either a choice or some, uh, they will just give you a language as, as a given. Um, so let's call this basic um, education here, you finish with two foreign languages and obviously speaking your, your native tongue as well, so. Uh, so which languages are your sons studying? Uh, at the moment, it's only English. Uh, they tried with German, but they didn't particularly like it. And they said that they will learn Italian from us. All right. That's their goal at the moment. Um, we also have Heather who is wondering, um, if so many you know, people start learning English so early, Will most American travelers be able to get by if they just speak English? Without a shadow of a doubt, yes. Yeah, you will. Um, you may not be able to get into a very deep conversation with everybody, but you will be able to get the basic information about going left, going right, stopping there and doing that from 99% of the people around here. So you should not worry. Now, Sasha, Julianne actually was noting earlier today when we were meeting that um, it's so impressive how many great English idiomatic phrases, you know, like, for example, without a shadow of a doubt or, you know, in this neck of the woods. Um, what's maybe a fun, um, in addition to 300 hairy bears, are there any good um, Slovenian phrases um, that could be helpful for travelers to know? Um... I would say, I wouldn't go into phrases that much. I would go into just the basic wording and um, a thank you will take you a long, long way. And a hello. I yeah, always say hello and thank um, you in Slovenian. So hello, uh, if you want to be very formal, you will say dober dan. Which dober dan. translated means good day. Dober dan. Dober dan. Dober Perfect. Dan. And then um, to say thank you, you will say Hvala. Hvala. This one is a little bit tricky because the age happens very deep in your throat. So, Hvala. Hvala. Uh, and this, this too, if you open up uh, uh, your conversation with a very simple Dobar dan, and whenever the service happens and, or whatever the situation is happens, you will say Hvala to the locals. Um, you will be very much appreciated. We're small but we are very proud of our language and um, this will really open doors and help you with your future engagement with that person or with anybody else in Slovenia. Exactly, and Rick always says that as well, that he you know, really only speaks English, but that it's not just pragmatic and helpful to know a few phrases, but it's just a way to show respect to the yes. locals there that you at least took the time to learn a few phrases in their language. Ooh, I agree with that absolutely, and it will be appreciated around here, definitely. Um, so John is wondering, Sasho, is for most is is the public transportation in Slovenia good? If people are going to be planning their trip, I know you said to go to rural areas to rent a car. Should people rent a car even if they're going in between cities, or are there good bus or train connections? You have very good bus connections there's relatively okay uh, train connections as well we just got a big uphold of of the railway system here in slovenia so you can easily rely on public transportation around here it does require a bit more patience and also the knowledge that you may be limited with certain locations that are slightly more let's call it off the beaten track so mm -hmm. no, easy with public transportation and Wendy was wondering, um, we saw from the, the footage of the Socha Valley that Slovenia is a very literally green country, but uh, she was wondering, is it kind of figuratively green? Is it a pretty eco-friendly country? Is that 
something that Slovenes think about? Oh, we do. We do. Uh, we are more and more understanding that what was given by nature to us is something that we need to appreciate and respect. Uh, you will hardly ever see litter on the floor. Uh, if you see something along the road, I dare say it was mostly thrown out by a tourist. Um, so no, we are very proud and we try to be as green as we possibly can. There's a couple of places now in Slovenia who are going zero waste as the philosophy of, of the town and so on. Um, so yes, yeah, we recycle, we do all sorts of things we do with, with uh, remaining as green as we possibly can. Um, so yeah, absolutely. We are absolutely in favor of that. Yep. And um, speaking of your natural wonders, um, we saw the Julian Alps and um, Susan is wondering, do you know why they're named the Julian Alps? There's a couple of anecdotes. There's a couple of stories. Um, they bloom most beautifully in the summer. So let's call it, you know, June, July, Julian. Uh, Julius Caesar apparently crossed them as well. That's one of the legends and so on. So there's a couple of stories. Um, let's just stick with the one that makes the most sense uh, because there's no way of proving that Julius Caesar was here ever. Um, let's just say that they bloom most nicely in the summertime and this is where the name comes from. So would you recommend, we always have people that are interested in knowing what's the best time to visit. Um, so maybe for people who are, are hikers um, and want to get up in the Alps, would you recommend July as the best time? Uh, depending on how high the, in the Alps you want to go. Now, if you want to become a proper Slovenian and uh, climb Mount Triglau, our highest mountain, um, then August, because this is where the weather will be the most stable. You can still be surprised by a nasty storm in July, June, July. It's easy for those. Um, for people who tend to stay closer to the ground, uh, I would say anywhere between May and October. It just depends on which season of the year you like. Uh, if you don't like heat, then avoid July and August because it gets fairly warm around here as well. If you cannot stand it, then I would say stay away unless you are a mountaineer and if you want to go uh, up high, then July and August are ideal for you. So just depending on what you want, but uh, yeah. And uh, you seemed to insinuate that true Slovenian hikers go to the top of, is, is it Mount Triglo? Triglau, yes. Triglau. Yeah. Have you summited Mount Triglau four times? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I have a couple under my belt. It's it's not that demanding at all. It's just, uh, yeah, it is a, a sort of a sense of national pride. You see the outline of Mount Triglau saying in the in the Slovenian coat of arms, whenever we are connect, whenever there's a patriotic statement that we want to make, uh, we will use the outline of Mount Triglau. Three glau in our language means three heads. And if you look at the mountain from a certain perspective, it actually looks like it has three peaks, so three heads. And this is where the name comes from. If you follow sports, uh, all of the Slovenian athletes in the national um, jerseys, they will have this outline of Mount Triglau presented in one way or the other. So it's been a symbol of the, of the country since the early 1900s. Oh, wonderful. I. And can you do it? Is it a hike that you can do in just one day? If you're super fit, yes. It's going to be a 16-hour day, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's uh, theoretically, it's doable uh, from, I hike a bit. Uh, I'm nowhere near enough experience to be smart about anything, but uh, Triglau, if you're a visitor and if you're reasonably fit, I would say my recommendation would be to do it in two days. Mm -hmm. uh, you do practically three quarters of the way in day one, you summit and then return down on day two. And that would always be my recommendation because just less, less stress and it's just more. Mm -hmm. You're enjoying it more, you're not sprinting through the mountains, which is never a preferable activity. Um, Sasha, we have a question from, um, oh, from Linda, who's wondering how expensive is Slovenia um, compared to some other European countries? Uh, uh, how should we, how should we put it? you can easily compare us to the lesser known places of Italy, say. We're nowhere near Venice or, or Rome or M Milan or something of that nature, but uh, we can easily compare with, with uh, prices in lesser visited parts of Italy or Austria for that matter. Again, minus Vienna, Salzburg and the big names. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, competitive to Italy and Austria, you will be roughly in in that zone if you if you're more familiar with those places. Um, I don't know. I mean, a coffee will easily set you back a euro and a half. In other places, it's going to be two, two and a half. Um, a, a decent enough meal in a good enough restaurant, let's say a dinner, you can get by with 20, 25 euros per person, depending on how much wine you will add during the dinner. But for food alone, you know, you, you can sort of keep in mind that a reasonable place will be somewhere between 20 and 25 euros for a dinner for one person. So not terribly expensive, but the prices are getting to the level where we can compare them to say, yeah, most reality. Excellent. And we have time for one more question tonight, Sasho. Um, and that question is going to be either, um, what is your favorite memory from a Rick Steves Europe tour or which place are you most excited to take travelers back to? on either the Eastern Europe or Adriatic tour. So either your favorite memory or where you're, um, what you're most looking forward to. I'll take the opportunity and answer both. Um, I don't have a very specific um, memory from the Rick Steves tours that comes to mind, but um, the answer that would come to mind, but the one thing that always strikes me is um, we start the tour on day one as a band of people who just met and uh, we part ways uh, two weeks after as a bunch of good friends and we there's a number of people I still keep in touch with back from you know from the early early on uh, when I started with the company so this is the one thing the memory that will always last is the camaraderie among the travelers and I hope to see much more of that this year I did miss that uh, with this corona situation that we've had globally um, for the towns that I'm most excited to, or play locations that I'm most excited to visit again after this lockdown, uh, it's going to be Prague definitely and Krakow uh, when we talk about the Eastern Europe tour and for the Adriatic uh, split uh, is one of the highlights that I sort of enjoy the most on the tour and I'm looking forward to getting back there uh, in less than three weeks time. Excellent. Well, I look forward to hearing from you how those tours go. But as for tonight's virtual tour, I can say it was fantastic. Um, I think that all of our, our merry band of travelers tonight uh, very much enjoyed it. And we thank you for taking time out of the middle of your night to teach us a little bit about your country, Sasho. Thank you for having me. All right. And everyone, I want to remind you that next week, uh, we got a little taste of Easter today, but we're going to get a big helping of Easter next week and not any kind of Easter, but Greek Easter. So Julianne will be hosting and she will be joined by Apostolo Duras, one of our Greek guides, um, and they will be talking about Easter in Greece and especially the Greek Orthodox Easter. So um, you can register for that at ricksteves.com and we hope to see you there. Um, thank you though for joining us on this voyage through Slovenia. We hope that you're able to get there in person soon and we thank you for joining us. Have an excellent night. Good night, Sasho. Good night, Julianne, and good night to all of you. Good night. Good night.